Well, I'm going to be teaching tonight and for foreseeable future. And I still haven't settled on exactly what I'm going to pursue except for the beginning of this time together. I'm going to discuss two different persons found in the Bible. You're familiar with them. First one being Adam. And then when we finish with that, and I'm not sure how far I'll get in the remainder of our time, I want to uh, discuss Abraham. And I ask you to turn now to the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis means origins. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And uh, I'll read that, and you read along with me, please. Genesis 5, 1 through 5. Uh, herein Moses wrote, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day that they were created. And Adam lived in hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were eight hundred years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. Now that's the Old Testament uh, portion that I want to deal with. And I'll take you now to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22. And here the apostle writes, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Then I want to look a little later into that chapter, verses 45 through 49, and we have this. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Howbeit that is not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Then that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is of heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, if you look at Romans 5 and verse 14, you will see that Paul refers to the fact that Adam stands as a type of Christ. And that passage reads, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. What? Adam is the figure of him that was to come. He's a type of Christ. Now, these are the basic passages that I would like for us to keep in mind as we engage in this study of Adam. And we'll try to be as fundamental as we know how to be. First of all, I want to consider Adam as to his origin. It took God five 24-hour days to prepare the earth for man's habitation. Then on the sixth day, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over every fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 26, 27. Now, when we come to chapter 2 of Genesis, in verse 7, we have more of the specific details that are related to Adam's origin. First of all, we notice that God formed Adam's body from the dust of the earth. Next of all, we see that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And I want to comment more on that term, breath of life, in a moment. And thus man became a living soul. You will remember that I comment on breath of life. You'll remember that when God destroyed the earth in Noah's day by a flood. He tells um, Noah that everything going to be destroyed, destroyed that had the breath of life. Well, in the Hebrew, it's breath of lives. Now, that covered more than all men on the earth besides Noah and his family, the ark. It covered animals also. Sometimes we read breath of life and we think that is the key significance here that he has a spirit fathered by God, as the Hebrews writer said, put into his body. Uh, really, it doesn't. And the Hebrew used to describe the animal's breath of lives is the same as it is here. It refers to biological life. When biological life began, God infused, for lack of a better way to put it, the spirit of man made in his own image into man. Now, I say that because it's complete harmony with what James said when he really defined death in the simplest of ways. The body apart from the spirit is dead. So a human life shares to a certain extent, and Mark that I said a, to a certain extent, with the biological lives of animals around us. But there's a difference. There is a spirit that is fathered by God in his own image. It's been put in us, and the bride of Hebrews says God's the father of our spirits. Our parents fathered our fleshly body. They did not father our spirits. God fathered our spirit. Thus, in the flood, uh, any man outside the ark and any animal outside the ark would die because they'd drown. But now the men who died had a spirit. And according to the writer of Ecclesiastes, when you die, it returns to God who gave it. Now, Peter will remark along this line, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, and he goes on and talks about that, and he talks about that Christ went and preached to the spirits in prison. Well, he didn't preach to them once they were in the Hadean world, such as where the rich man was in the rich man of Lazarus. He preached to them during the time the ark was preparing. But they were disobedient. When the flood came, they died. Right along with all the rest that had the breath of life. But obviously, their spirit fathered by God and dying in a rebellious state, their spirits went to what Peter calls the spirits in prison. But through Noah, Christ had preached to those people preceding the flood. So it's interesting to note sometimes, and I bring that out now, about the breath of life, because I've seen this in dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses who don't believe that we have a spirit, as I've described it just now, and as the Bible teaches, but who believe the body itself, the physical body, is the, is the soul. And sometimes we go to Genesis uh, 1, 26 and 27, and we try to say, see, we're more than an animal. Well, that's really not the verse to go to. It certainly points out that biologically we function and a horse functions and a goat functions and so forth. 
But our spirits are fathered by God, and our parents did not give us our spirits. And when we die, then the spirit leaves, and the body apart from the spirit is dead. And we know from the rest of the study of the Bible where our spirits go. If we're saved or if we're innocent, we go into paradise and Hades and world, awaiting the end of the world of the judgment and the resurrection. If a person is lost, separated from God, whether apostate or never had obeyed the gospel, that person goes right to where Ken referred to him again a while ago in uh, the torment part of the Hadean world, the place of departed spirits. So just uh, to refine that a little bit concerning the breath of life, because notice it does say God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now, we should note to further, now I get back online with Adam, we should note carefully that Adam was both created and made. Created and made. He was made in the moral, rational image of God. God fathered our spirits. We bear the imprint of deity. And he was named Adam. It simply signifies the red earth. I suppose if you want to, we've got, a, we've got pretty good evidence to say that uh, Adam was made out of red earth. Uh, I don't know what color his skin was, but Adam in the Hebrew means red earth. They had a bride. Because God looked at the man alone out of all that was created, and Adam had named all these animals, yet there wasn't anything as a suitable help for Adam like there was among the animals. So we begin to look at this, and we see that the word man, simple word, M-A-N, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, includes, notice this, male and female. Notice it says male and female created he them. And God himself said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That means suitable for him, Genesis 2.20. Now, in the naming of all the animals, you'll notice God impressed upon Adam his need. I want to underscore that. Adam's need. Impressed upon Adam his own need for a suitable companion. Chapter 2 and verse 20. A suitable companion. Sometimes I hear people say, reading the King James Version, well, she's a help me. I don't know they know what they're saying or not. But that's not the way we should read that. It's a help meet for him. Suitable, that's what meet meant back in the days of 1611. It meant a suitable thing. So God made the bride for Adam. Well, he caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam. And while Adam slept, God opened his side, and from that opening, he took one of Adam's ribs, and he made from that rib, rib a woman. Then God presented the woman to Adam. Now, we know God is omniscient and omnipotent. And we know that he can do whatever can be done that's in harmony with his very essence from which he's derived his nature. He could have chosen another way to supply a suitable help for Adam, but he chose this way. Now, knowing God does not do something simply like we might sometimes. Well, I start out to do this, and I just decided I'd do something else, so I did something else. Everything he does, the right amount of energy, no more, no less, is put into it. The right amount of planning, no more, no less, 
was before that. So he had a reason taking the woman with the side of the man and from one of the ribs. He could have made her out of the same red earth that he made Adam, but he didn't. Now, for a person who wants to think a little bit about this and knowing the Bible is revelation of God to us, should that make us think knowing God is as God is, why he did this? Notice when Adam saw her, he said, this is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That word woman really uh, in English really means a womb man or a man with a womb. And we talk about her being female because that's what God said. Important to understand without a male, there's no female. I don't mean that in a haughty, proud, arrogant way. I'm just simply saying the female, as you read of it here in God's good word, was created as a suitable help for the male. Well, there's no male, there's can't have help for him. God then said, because of what we noted earlier. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Now, if a man is not of such maturity, growth and development, where he can leave his father and mother who brought him to this world, who nourished him, who taught him, who trained him, who set a godly example for him, he's not able to leave that he's not able to cleave. Not as God intended and sets it out here. A man shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be, that is, they'll become one flesh. Well, we have no one flesh. That means that they just meld together because there's only one being standing there, one body. We know that this is a component that is the leaving and cleaving, a component parts necessary to start a home and to have before that a marriage. And where there is no marriage, there's not going to be a home. Now watch it. Acceptable to God. It's sort of like baptism. There are all sorts of people out there that call things baptism. But there's only one true baptism. And so it is when it comes down to only one true marriage that God sanctions and thus one home derived therefrom. But they are to be unified. They're to be one. They're to be in agreement. They're to work together. Now, notice they have roles, husband, wife. The role of the husband is not that of the wife. The wife is not that of the husband. Together as parents, they have a role to their children. We're not going to go into all that in detail, but I suggest to you there's a great amount of information and learning that to be a glean starting from the very fact of God making the woman the way he did, Eve. And uh, what Adam said about her, Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And also interested, not interesting to note that uh, t when when the man is being taught in the New Testament, the husband how to treat his wife, Peter will talk about uh, loving her as his own flesh. For no man ever hated his own flesh. And lo and behold, back over here. He says Adam does in seeing Eve. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. There was intended to be that, a little more insight into why God would make Eve from one of Adam's ribs. And then it is, after we have these comments, more could be gotten out of it, but we see God blessing them. And he says to them, be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 1, verse 28. One thing this does is show us that God made male and female the sexual setup as he did, intending fully for male and female 
in scriptural marriage as husband and wife to enjoy the fruitfulness and multiplying and replenishing the earth. It was all set out there in the beginning. Now, here's some time ago, I don't know when it was, some time ago, maybe in uh, class on Sunday morning, I pointed out that uh, there's a lot to be learned from such things as this regarding the fruitful to multiply. The idea of having one man and one woman in a union called marriage producing children. That it is something that is set up by God. Man didn't make this arrangement. But he expects man to carry it out. Now, it's important to understand here these things, when we're studying with people today in view of the complete rejection, almost complete rejection, of the truth of God's word concerning marriage and the responsibilities of a husband and wife to one another and as parents to children and so forth, because people find themselves in such a mess. And even where there are marriages, they're scriptural, then you find a lot of people don't have a happy marriage. They partially don't have that happy marriage because the man doesn't understand what he ought to be doing, doesn't understand the attitude he ought to have toward his wife. He may see her and say, bone of my bone, let me break her bones or something like that. He doesn't understand what all is meant here. The implications drawn from the revelation Moses gives us concerning the creation of man and woman, Adam and Eve, and so forth, and their attitude one toward another and how God created them, just are amazing as to what they can produce and understanding the disposition of mind and attitude and feelings even that ought to exist between the husband and the wife and responsibility. Well, so much for that now. But they were to be fruitful to multiply. Now, the first home God gave him, gave them was a place made for people without sin. It's important to understand. He planned a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Genesis 2 verse 8. But even then, that is in Eden, a place prepared for sinless people, he didn't intend for man to be idle. That's one reason I know that when we are resurrected in the glorified body at the end of the world and the judgment day is over and we enter heaven, there's going to be something to be done. There's something God has in store for us, which I understood. I know it involves what I'm doing now and laboring to be faithful and build a character according to the New Testament teaching and walking in the footsteps of Christ. I know it involves the fight of faith that we have here and proving to God we love him. We know that our love truly leads us to obey his commandments, that our faith, our trust, our confidence built on the word of God truly allows us to obey him. I know all that has to do with forming a character fitted for eternity to exist in the body like our Lord presently has. So in Eden, he didn't intend for man to be idle. In chapter 2 and verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. I don't know what all was involved there. Don't know what all addressing it keeps you. I know what I would do if I were dealing with a peach tree or dealing with an apple tree. I don't know what trees they had. Totally different setup from what we have now. God had made wonderful provisions for the man and his wife. And I'll go over this and then we'll stop for tonight. In the fruit of the trees, they had the sustenance that they needed. Then there's that tree of life, which we know nothing. And it would preserve them and keep them from dying. Yet they were in physical body. Then there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There would be a, now watch this, a positive divine law for the training of moral character, a 
It's important to keep in mind. It's a good place to stop. I've said many times, this life is perfect. Perfect meaning complete. This life of the flesh and time and space and material things is complete for what God intended to accomplish with it. Now, God being omniscient, he knew Adam and Eve's sin because he knows all the object of knowledge, yet his foreknowledge did not hinder their free moral agency, and thus they did what they did. And he made provision for all of that, and we may get into some of that later on. But I'm trying to get us to see by studying Adam, and hopefully later on when we get into Abraham, just what can be learned from passages we may have read time and time again over many, many years, that we can catch some things in them as well as for those who may not be that familiar as first-time arounders, if there is such a word as that, that they can study and learn also. We didn't start out with a prayer, so I'm going to end with a prayer tonight. You would bow with me, please. Our Father and God, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're thankful for this time together. We're thankful for this technology. We pray that wherever we are, we'll study thy word with the intent to carry out Thy will, may we reverence thee, stand in fear of thee, and be filled with love for thee and thy cause and the truth of thy word. Help us to learn the truth and hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.